installing it. Hey guys, it's Joel and welcome back to the channel and to a brand new series called Too Much Information. Now my reasoning behind that titling is because, well, my reviews of late have been quite long and I intend to keep it that way because I just really enjoy getting to grips and getting under the skin of all the cars that I am lucky enough to drive and feature. I like to get inside and press every single button, see what it does. And hopefully for those of you watching who either own these cars or want to own one at some point, you'll be able to get a lot of insight from these videos. And so today we're starting off this new format with a really interesting car, sort of a car of the people really, an E46 320 Cabriolet. This one has the lovely five-speed manual and is in a particular specification, which I quite enjoy actually. It's a dark blue color with a creamy beigey interior. Very, very classy indeed. The owner, Matthew, has very kindly allowed me to use this car for the afternoon and to enjoy it and it couldn't have been a better day for it. Matthew's quite a young chap himself and he says that this is his first sort of performance car and if you don't want to go any further in the review I think ultimately that's what these are great for. They are great as entry-level performance cars particularly for younger people. However if you are slightly older I wouldn't switch off now, I wouldn't dismiss or discount one of these. In fact, I see myself as a little bit of an old man and I think these are absolutely fantastic. Speaking of old man, these E46 Generation 3 Series were released all the way back in 1997. Now that was quite a shocker for me when I realised that because that was actually the year that I was born. So this platform of car is quite literally as old as me. So this E46 Generation 3 Series comes in many different shapes and sizes. In fact, I think there were five different configurations of this car. There was the coupe, the convertible like we have here. There was the touring, there was the saloon or the sedan, and then there was that compact. I think they're, I guess, be classed as a hatchback potentially. I think that comes under the E46 umbrella as well. And not only that, there were a bunch of different engines you could choose from. I think at least 10, but we'll probably go through those in a second. So you'll likely be no stranger to the E46 3 Series platform. And that's because, well, they made a fair few of them. They made about 2 million of these E46 cars over the nine years or so of production. In fact, these were produced in Leipzig, which is the same city that manufactured my Porsche Cayenne. But yes, almost 2 million. I think the official figures around 1.9 million of these were built. And in 2002 alone, 560,000 of these came out of the factory. I mean, I can't actually get my head around that. That's something crazy like 1,500 a day. That's just very quick maths. I could be completely wrong, but that is a serious, serious amount of cars. And it's fair to say that these were, at the time, extremely popular. And to be honest, they still are today. And it's a good thing that so many of these were made if you're in the market in 2024 because it means there are still so many of them around and if you do find yourself with one that needs some work or some maintenance there's plenty and plenty of parts at very affordable costs. There were many many engine and gearbox pairings available with these E46 3 Series all the way down from four cylinders and a four speed automatic in the early days up to well the E46 M3 which obviously has the famous S54 3.2 litre straight six engine, or actually you can go one higher than that with the Alpina, the B3, which had a 3.4 litre engine. One which I've actually experienced in an Alpina Z4 before, which was very, very good, I have to say. This particular example is somewhere towards the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to displacement. However, despite the fact it's a 320, because it's a 2004 model year car, that still actually means it has a 2.2 litre six cylinder engine, the M54 block, which is such a diverse block because it goes all the way from 2.2 up to three litres in the likes of the 330CI. Now don't be fooled because if you had a car, I think pre, I think it was pre 2002 as a 320, that would in fact be a four cylinder two litre engine, which, well, I've never driven one, but from what I've heard there, not as pokey and not as nice sounding, but they're also far more unreliable than this very, very dependable and sturdy M54 block in this. Now, as it is only 2.2 litres, it's not particularly powerful, actually. It was kind of an underwhelming figure when I first found out. 170 horsepower. 
Doesn't sound like an awful lot. In fact, it's not an awful lot, but you have to remember this car's 20 years old now, and so it doesn't weigh 25 tons. In fact, it weighs about one and a half tons, but what's more important is it's a very small package, 4.4 meters long, but only just under 1.8 meters wide, making it feel actually very, very narrow. I think when I stepped straight into this after driving my KN to Matthew's house, I felt like I'd got into a motorbike, it was that narrow. But it is quite a small package, not ever so heavy. Uh, it's obviously a little bit heavy because this is the convertible one, uh, but 170 horsepower. So the power ideally and hopefully should go quite a long way, but we'll see once we step inside and take it for a drive. So these things are numerous then, and as well as there being many, many parts and places that can actually service these things around, they're also not particularly expensive to buy. You can pick up examples with MOTs, but that's about it for as little as 1,500 quid, all the way up to spending seven or 8,000 pounds for something like this age with quite low mileage. But I think somewhere in between that is almost the best place to be. Now, I hope Matthew won't mind me saying this, the owner of this car. Cosmetically speaking, this is not the finest example. In fact, inside the car, it looks quite worn in places. However, I have noticed it is on Michelin Pilot Sport 4 tires, and the owner reliably tells me that he has spent quite a lot of money on things like suspension, coolant issues and getting this car mechanically sound and for me that's what these cars are all about they're all about the drive and so when they are a little bit cosmetically bruised here and there it doesn't really bother me all that much and because these things aren't particularly expensive it doesn't really matter if they are battered and bruised i will just reiterate though the color on this car in particular is gorgeous especially in this light from different angles it changes it's a really really lovely color in fact i'll put it down on screen now i'll ask the owner what the color is and let you guys know right so let's step into this lovely beige interior then on this three series and immediately the most familiar thing is the dials i always like to talk about dials but i think for me this generation of BMW just did it best. I don't think it's ever been done better. These dials invoke such a nostalgia in me that I can't even describe. And I think it comes from when I was quite young, my family had a friend called Dave who worked in the city and he bought a brand new BMW Z3. This must have been back in 2002, before the Z4 came out. And he took us out in a spin for it. And I remember seeing those dials and more specifically the speed needle going so fast up past 20 and 40 and 60 miles an hour and that level of excitement that i experienced in that moment is what comes back to me when i see these dials it's really really lovely and very nostalgic then we also have again in my opinion one of the best shapes of bmw wheels ever i love this three spoke design again quite a thick rim as we did have actually in the last bmw convertible i did the one series quite a thick rim uh, quite a thick wheel not my favorite and this one could do with a little bit of a retrim potentially but quite a lot of functionality cruise control here on the right which i did use earlier on and works very very well fingertip controls for changing tracks on the audio system or upping or downing the volume and here on the stalks we can manipulate what our little information display below tells us uh, it can tell us about our range our fuel economy our average speed the time and a few other things but before we go into much more detail i want to say a big thank you to today's video sponsor carly and show you a little bit about what they can do for you so you may have seen one of these before this is a carly obd adapter and in this tiny little piece of technology you can do so much with your car and potentially unlock a whole host of hidden features so to do this then you need to plug in your obd reader to your car's obd port so this is a bmw 3 series it's a 2004 car and it's an e46 convertible gasoline and in just a few seconds we have connected to the car now one major benefit of having carly is the ability to perform your own diagnostics i think that's of particular use on a car like this which is 20 years old and so what we're going to do now is go into the diagnostics tab here you can see all of the systems that carly is going to check from the abs and traction control the air conditioning and heating 
all the way to the chassis electronics and the engine and powertrain. We're gonna check for issues and after a few minutes, it's gonna tell us hopefully what isn't wrong with this car, but I'm sure it will pick up a few things that we might want to address. So you can see that 11 issues have been found, which I have to admit is not necessarily too bad. It depends what the issues are. We can see here we have a red issue for the dynamic stability control, which is our traction control system. When we click into this and look for further explanation, Carly tells us that pressure sensor one is electrically defective. And we can go into the smart mechanic here, which can give us a list of instructions or at least troubleshooting steps to try and fix this ourselves. At the very least, this will point us in exactly the right direction of what we need to get fixed, whether it be from your driveway but one thing I love in particular is the coding functionalities so for example with this particular car being a convertible one thing that you can do is open and close the soft top roof from your key fob however on this car as with many that I've seen it's switched off by default so by using Carly we can go into here click on and click on for open and close we hit code now and after a few seconds just like that, it is done. And now when we try and use the key to close the soft top roof, we hold the lock button here and away she goes. So if you'd like to try Carly for yourself, go to the link in the description now and use code JOEL24. Anyway, I think it's time to put the roof back down. To the right of the wheel, then we have our controls for the lights with front and rear fogs. No automatic function on this particular car, but there is a manual scroll wheel for adjusting how bright the instrument lights are. We then have a fairly generous door bin on the side here. Probably not big enough to fit a water bottle, but certainly big enough for your phone, your wallet, your keys, all of the general things that you carry around with you could all fit in there at the same time. We then have electric mirror controls and this one the button must have gone missing for because the owner has stuck on a piece of Lego instead. The seats can be adjusted electronically with these controls down the side. Very familiar if you've owned or driven any BMW of this generation. For example, the X5, the Z4, the 3 Series will all have the same design of seats and controls. With lots of adjustability, you can extend out this leg support here using this manual control. You can go forwards and backwards, up and down, and of course you can recline yourself too. This car also does have a memory function with three different options, which is probably very handy for when I give this car back to Matthew and his seats in a completely different position. The steering wheel can be adjusted up and down, forwards and backwards with a pretty good range of adjustability. There's gonna be something there for everyone. And then if we move down into the center console, which is where most of the stuff is going on in this car, and despite it being 20 years old, there is quite a lot to talk about. Now, as you can see, this particular E46 has had an aftermarket Apple CarPlay head unit installed. And so we're not gonna go through the functionalities of this because, well, your E46 will probably not have one. And if you'd asked me a year ago about what I thought of these aftermarket head units, well, I probably would have just involuntarily thrown up all over you. However, since buying my KN and living now with a wireless Apple CarPlay system that's been integrated into that car, I have to admit I'm a complete convert. I think when they don't look too obnoxious and they integrate themselves into essentially where the infotainment would have gone before, yeah, I'm quite happy to see them. They do tend to work very well. Then below we have all the controls for our air conditioning. Just a one zone air conditioning on this car. You can choose where you want all of the air to go. Actually on this particular car, the air conditioning isn't working, but that's okay because we can take the lid off. We then have the controls for the roof up and down. It's quite a quick affair. I timed it going down at 22 seconds. And then DSC, which is our button for controlling the traction control, of which there are two stages. If you press this down once with a simple touch, it will take the traction control off. However, if you hold it down for a few seconds, it will also then remove stability control, which is what you're gonna want in a car like this with just 170 horsepower to be able to have all the fun. Then we have a cigarette or 12 volt input here. Then we have a lovely gear knob, a real centerpiece of any manual BMW. I find these shifts are always so nicely weighted. And I think this is a modified stubby gear shifter. I could be wrong, it could have come with the car, but 
it does feel really lovely to hold and I'm sure as we'll find out really really fantastic to shift with. We have various buttons for the windows in fact probably three too many actually this one here in the middle on my side will control all four windows yes there is four because of course we do have a couple of back seats in this e46 then we have individual for my side controlling right and right rear and then on this side we have left front left rear quite a few buttons essentially a button for every single little window and then one to control all at once which is really good to have hazard light switch and door unlock and lock and then some cup holders which is always fantastic to see these ones are pretty decent size now this looks like an aftermarket thing here i'm not too sure if it is or not it does look very afterthoughty and of course it's in a different color and material to the rest of the trim in the car it fits in nicely so if it is aftermarket it's obviously made for the e46 however if it's not it's a very very strange design and then this is where we get to the really fun stuff because with this being a early noughties bmw it was over engineered and there's things like this so on the face of it just looks like a plastic panel but if you push down here in this little indent it reveals a semicircle coin holder so you put your coins in like this you push in this one's a bit bigger and it hold it in there and you can get a few in so back in the day when we used to use cash and coins for paying for parking i would imagine this is the main utility for this uh, it would have been very very handy but if you're like me i really rarely carry well cash let alone coins with me anymore but that is a lovely lovely designed thing very very tactile feels well made obviously still working after all these years but kind of useless because you have this little storage area here which is much easier to just place your coins in but i just love to see things like that on older cars because you don't really see these sorts of things on anything newer than about 10 years old we also have a manual handbrake which is of course a rarity these days in fact actually you never ever see manual handbrakes anymore the rear view mirror here is auto dimming and of course with the roof down just beautiful views of the buckinghamshire countryside behind and some lights here for the interior now that is pretty much it here up front we do also have this storage compartment here which you can fit quite a few things in and as you can see a particular part here for your mobile phone but this would probably have fit a blackberry at the time and certainly not a modern day device but again this would also be a very suitable place for you to put your coins and makes the use of this rather redundant but i still love that it's there this does double up as an armrest but i find actually for me with where the gear knob is it's kind of in the way i prefer to have it up so that i've got a little bit more room for my elbow uh, below but that is also what this can be used for so with that then this is a four-seater car, remember, so let's jump in the back and see, well, if there's anything to play with back there, but also how much room there is. Right then, so let's see what it's like in the back of the 3 Series. I've got quite high hopes for this, actually. The last time I did this was in a 1 Series Cabriolet belonging to my father, and so it'll be interesting to compare the space difference between the two. You would expect this is a little bit more spacious. Let's find out anyway, and pop the seat back now this seat is in my driving position and i have to say as with the one series the space in here is very good the knee room is fantastic i think the seat's quite low at the front because my feet are touching the bottom of it whereas in the one series i remember being able to put them underneath without touching anything like the one series it's very similar in the way that the shape of the car obviously arcs inwards towards the rear and so the only restriction really is on my side here where the car actually comes in with the roof down it's very comfortable because i can stick my arm out like this i think with the roof up it'll be a little bit more restrictive there is an armrest here however which you can use when the roof's up but it's kind of a odd position but still nicely trimmed in leather so it's comfortable for my elbow there are adjustable headrests which again like the one series is a really nice touch and it means you could genuinely spend a good amount of time sat back here as a fully grown adult like me although for reference i'm about five foot nine and a half so a little bit below average probably it is 
very comfortable though and the truth is that most people don't ever use these seats which means that the condition of the leather back here is fabulous in terms of toys if there are any well there is this little thing in front of me what is that it's a tiny storage compartment nothing under there do have nets on the back of the seat so you can actually store things without worrying about them going missing and then this what's this this looks like something i can move i'm not sure about this it looked like it might be an armrest that i can fold down however i can't work it out and it's not my car so i don't really want to break it maybe that's an armrest maybe it's a through loading hatch i'm not sure what these are they look like they might just be clips for holding things but i could be all wrong uh, the one series if i remember correctly did actually have an armrest in the middle so if this doesn't have it then that's one up there for the one series but i have to say is it more spacious than the one series cabriolet from 2010 11 uh, no i think it's probably about the same in fact this car probably is about the same size as that one series being 10 year old older design so let's stop larking about back here then let's jump in the front back into the driver's seat take this thing out for a drive and see what it's like and see if that 2.2 litre 170 horsepower engine is enough So here we are then in the E46 320Ci and well, I've got a bit of a confession to make actually in that I've never driven an E46 despite owning a Z4 which was from the same era as this for many years and seeing and lusting after many E46s over all of this time I've never actually driven one. Immediately though you feel at home these seats are very very comfortable the dials are recognisable and really really satisfying to look at and it is a nice place to be. Despite rarely driving manual cars at the moment, I feel very quickly acquainted with this five-speed box. The throws are lovely, especially that third into fourth, I absolutely adore. You do notice the age of the car quite quickly. I think driving with the roof up, there is a fair amount of rattles going on. I think quite a lot of these age BMWs do suffer with being a little bit rattly at times. It's not all that refined either, driving along only at 35 miles per hour now, and you can hear a fair bit of noise, maybe a little bit of air escaping through this fabric roof somewhere. The owner of this car tells me he has actually had the roof replaced, along with a bit of suspension stuff, so I've got no real reason to believe there's anything wrong with the car when it comes to its ride and the rattly nature of it, but it is quite a jumpy old thing. I know that the owner has changed the alloy wheels on this car, although they're not any bigger than a standard car would have, so I can't believe it's anything to do with that either. I'll tell you what though, as the air conditioning isn't working in this car and it's a little bit rattly, there's no way to drive it really, is it? Let's pull over quickly and pop the roof down, and that's how I want to continue with this review. Oh yeah, so with the roof off, that's so much better, and it is a lovely day for it, but actually, the thing just feels more complete now. It doesn't feel as rattly, actually. It just feels lovely. It's a superbly easy thing to place on the road. I think that's helped by the fact it's so small, but the steering is very poignant as well. It's very direct, actually, and you don't need all that much input to turn the car. I absolutely adore the live MPG display in front of me. So you can see here, if I ease off the power, it goes up to above 50 miles per gallon, put some on and it goes down. I just think with things like that, you cannot be analog. I have absolutely great visibility out all sides and also out the back. Well, there's no roof, is there? So I can just see to the horizon. The steering wheel for me does feel a little bit too thick, but I think that's just down to personal preference. However, the seats are extremely supportive. I think they're wide enough for 99% of body shapes, but also when you do push on a little bit, there's a good amount of support there too. But what about the engine then? Well, I find it's a very efficient little thing, just posturing along at 35 miles an hour. We're maintaining an average of around 50 miles per gallon, which is great. But let's drop it into second, a little rev match there. And let's pop our foot down and see what happens. So there's 30 miles per hour foot down. Red line at just above six and a half thousand RPM and up to 60 just after changing into third. So a little heel and toe down into second. Oh yeah, he's still got it. Back on the power again here as we get onto this nice straight. And just like the M54 3 litre that was in my Z4, 
it's got that lovely instantaneous pickup and feeling of torque. However, the difference here is that when you get above four and a half or 5,000 RPM, unlike that three liter and even in the newer 2.5 liter, it doesn't really pick up anymore. It just maintains that same level of power. So you're not really particularly rewarded for pushing on. Let's go from first gear now all the way down. Yeah, there's just no higher end pickup that you get in the larger displacement models. Don't get me wrong though, for 170 horsepower, it's rather quite impressive. And when you get to the corners, you're doing the same speed anyway. And yeah, that steering, it's really, really direct. To be honest, when it comes to convertibles, I've always said the same thing, which is, it doesn't matter what you take the lid off, you could be driving anything. You could jump inside your washing machine and chop the roof off and take it out on a sunny evening like this. You'd get the same sensation of the wind rushing through your hair that you would in any convertible. Despite a bit of a lack of power compared to the bigger engine brothers and sisters of this car, it does still retain that lovely six cylinder noise. In fact, it's very much the same as what you'd have in a 2.5 or the three liter. It's a really sweet fizzing noise, a little bit more refined than what you might get in a six pot Boxster or Cayman. It's just a lovely note of raspiness coming out the back. And this being the Sport or the M Sport trim, it has the twin exit exhaust, which I think only aids with that sound and that nice styling as well. So it does at least look like one of those bigger engine cars. Brakes feel nice. And yeah, we just got endless grip with those Michelin Pilot Sport 4s. I mean, I was driving this very road last week in that Audi R8 that featured on my last video and I'm doing 55 miles an hour around those corners the truth is I was doing exactly the same speed in the R8 when you get to the twisty bits this thing will go pretty much as fast as anything else I think the thing is though if you can find a good one there's no real reason not to go for a bigger engine in these E46s okay the insurance might be a little bit more expensive for a younger person like Matthew on a bigger engine example but the road tax is gonna be much the same depending on which year you get. The fuel economy, well, I know that my three litre Z4 managed to get 40 MPG if I was trying. So there's not really any economical benefits of having the smaller displacement. From what I've read and heard, it's best to avoid the four cylinder cars. They can be a little bit more troublesome. Matthew, the owner of this car, says he's had some trouble with coolant issues. However, what BMW owner from this generation hasn't? And that is the great thing, as I mentioned earlier, that these things are so numerous that there are many, many specialists that are reasonably priced, but anyone that can fix these cars and so many parts readily available. The other thing as well is that because there's so many owners of these, there is a huge online community. And I remember when I owned my Z4, 99% of the issues that I encountered on a fairly regular basis, I could fix myself or at least get some peace of mind on just by doing a quick internet search because there's so many people out there that run these cars and will have experienced the same thing. So I think for the money then, these E46 Cabriolets are fantastic. If you're not a Cabriolet person, of course, there's the coupe and the saloon available if you want a bit more rear space. But I have to say, taking the roof off this car just back then absolutely transformed it for me. I wasn't really having a great time driving it with the roof up, but with the roof down, it could be in anything and just being able to enjoy the elements in something that handles so well and has a great soundtrack to be honest it doesn't get much better than this if you can find a nice one online in a lovely specification like this look for one that's got as little owners as possible but if it has many owners make sure it's got really good service history you want something like this that's been enthusiast owned and maintained in fact I would persuade you to go for a private seller as opposed to one that's sat on a dealer forecourt. I feel like if you can know the history and know the person that's been driving it for the last half many years, you're going to have a much better time of it. So I hope you all enjoyed this first edition of Too Much Information. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already. And if you've got a car that you'd like to see me feature, please do send me an email. It's in the description below or on screen now. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one very, very soon.